God is good. And all the time. Children, you're dismissed to Children's Church at this time. You thank God for our kids. Amen. We've got three people. They're thanking God for the kids. <laughs> I want to thank Dan for preaching last week. I heard he did a great job, and God moved, and that, that's a tremendous thing. I was preaching at the Lucas Ferry campus, and if you listened to that service or was there, I'm uh, probably going to get another helping because God has not released me from this message because I think it's a message that's much needed in our world. The title of this message is God's Pleasure. And do you know that God's pleasure is usually and always rooted in us? We are His workmanship. We are His pleasure. The question is, are we being faithful to bring God pleasure in all that we do? In Matthew chapter 3, there's a scripture that talks about Jesus and Jesus is doing something that is a necessary step for us and as people of faith and believers, but he's also doing something that may not be required by him because of necessity, but he's doing it because of some other reason. And let's read this together. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. Do not you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Say, fulfill all righteousness. Then John, he consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. And at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Say well pleased. The question this morning, is God well pleased with us? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the reading of your word. We ask this morning that you open our hearts and our minds to receive your truth. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Speak to us. We pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Is God pleased with us? Is God pleased with you? You say, well, I don't know, you know, I, I know that I can't be righteous. My righteousness is filthy rags. It was talked about in Sunday school this morning. And, and I agree with it, that our righteousness is like filthy rags to God and the best we can do. But that's talking about righteousness. That's talking about salvation. That's talking about our ability to do our thing. The question is, God pleased with your effort? God pleased with your heart? Is God pleased with what you're doing to say, I love you? To say, I want to be in right standing with you? To say, you're number one to me. Jesus was coming to John the Baptist who was baptizing people for the repentance of sin, for the washing away of sin, for the cleansing of sin, to be in righteousness and right standing with God. Righteousness doesn't mean perfect. Righteousness means you're in right standing with whomever you're to be reconciled with. If I'm in righteousness with my wife, it doesn't mean I'm perfect, but it means that I'm in right standing with her. And we share a relationship in the common bounds of righteousness. In other words, we're both in right standing. And when we're in right standing, things go much better than when we're not. Amen? It really does. Jesus was coming and asking John that he to be baptized. And John said, forbid this. No. You're the Lamb of God. You're perfect. 
don't let me do this. And he says, no, this must be done for me to be righteous before God, in right standing before God. Because, see, obedience is a big thing with God. Because we're his children. Parents, let me ask you a question. Is obedience from your children a big thing? Kind of a big thing, isn't it? It really is. And we say obedience. Obedience to what? Obedience for their health and welfare to start with. If a child is unobedient, it's not obedient, the first thing I have to do is be concerned for health, their health and welfare because if they're not going to mind, I'm going to be constantly concerned about their well-being and what they're doing. Have you ever been there? Scripture is full of places where God talks about the importance of obedience and no clearer as it is with Saul in 1 Samuel when Saul is about to go into war and, and God has given him the, the, the formula, so to speak, to what he must do before he goes into battle, that he will be prepared and right in right standing with God to do it. But you see, he failed to follow instructions. God told him there must be a sacrifice and there must be a sacrifice given by Samuel, which is the prophet, and that before they went into war, that his war would be fruitful. Or his battle would be fruitful and victory would take place. So Saul, being the new king of Israel, had everything in place and he was ready to fight the war. But Samuel the prophet was not there. And so Saul saying, I want to do everything just right. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and offer the sacrifice. Even though God told him you can't do that without Samuel. Samuel's the only one authorized to offer the sacrifice. Saul went on his own and decided to do his own thing and offer the sacrifice. And then Samuel came right after and he goes, what have you done? Read it for yourself. It's in 1 Samuel 15 verse 22 is when it begins. And Saul said, I had to be obedient. I offered the sacrifice. He said, no, you weren't obedient. You were disobedient. You, got, you tried to do everything right, but you did it the wrong way. Have you ever done something right the wrong way? <laughs> Think about that for a minute. You see, obedience is not doing all the things right. It's doing it the right way from the heart. Understanding the obedience of what and how God tells us to do things. It's very important. It's very important. Paul, I mean, Samuel goes on and tells Saul, he says, obedience. Listen, guy. He said, obedience is better than sacrifice. It's better than sacrifice. We just got through talking about tithes and offerings where you're supposed to bring the tithes and, and, and to the storehouse. And, and a lot of people will say, you know, I don't want to give my money, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to give them all my time. Every waking day I'm going to be at the church and stuff because I don't want to give my money because you see, money takes trust. It takes trust in God, not the money. And it's so hard for us to trust God more than what we see tangibly as far as what helps us make a living. And it's so difficult for us to let go of that and let God. And so we focus on this and we, and we say, mm, I tell you what, God, I'm going to sacrifice what I want to do in my personal life and stuff and I'm going to give you time. When God says, I don't want your sacrifice, I want your heart. And your heart is where your treasure is. And so many times we get miscommunicated in saying we're going to sacrifice the things we're willing to give up so we won't have to sacrifice the control of things or what possesses, actually possess our heart. What's possessing your heart? Is it just doing the right things? Or are you totally leading to God? Are you totally trusting God? Are you totally letting go to God? And I'm going to tell you, it's so difficult to do. Anybody ever gone rappelling? You know, where you get on a rope and you go down the side of the building? Well, I was in the Army, and it's one of those mandatory things that you've got to do. And so we were on a 30-foot tower, and we started with that. 
And as you go on a 30-foot tower, they put this Swiss seat on you. It's just some ropes that goes around your legs and stuff and around your waist, and you put your C-clamp on or your D-ring on, and, and you get your safety and your check valve and stuff. You go in, and, and you release what rope, and you go down, and you grab it, and because of the tension and stuff that it has and the way the rope is, it stops and doesn't let burn your hands so much. And it's, it's a neat little thing. But anyway, it's really fun, except the first part. Because you see, you feel like the rope and everything's got you when you're on the side of the building. And you're fully in control at it because you only go down as you release the rope and you grab it back and tie it back and you stop. You're in full control, except for that time that you're on the end of the building and you have to fall over. There's nothing to catch you. And you just have to surrender and fall over until that rope finally grabs you. And it's the scariest thing in the world. It really is. You sit there and you fall and you feel like nothing's got you. And you're going to fall until you finally get in position and that rope catches you. And then you know you're all right. You see, if you ever experience the fact of that you can trust God more than you can trust your own vision and sight, you will experience a thrill and a joy like you've never known before. But you got to get past that first step, that first hurdle to solely trust in God. Are y'all listening to me at all this morning? You got to get past that first hurdle. Obedience is better than sacrifice. God finds pleasure when we're obedient to God. The second thing is keeping commandments. Keeping commandments is a big thing. God says that if you love me, you will keep my commands, right? What are his commands? Well, love the Lord our God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And we say serve. Love God, love others, serve. On the first two, Jesus says all the commands of God hinge on these. John 14, 23 says this. If you love me, you will keep my commands. My commands are not to control. This is paraphrased. My, man, my commands are not to control. My commands are you for you to grow. And there's a huge difference with that. Control and grow. You see, when we keep the letter of the law in commands, it usually keeps us bound up. But when we keep the commands from our heart, it unleashes a fence and boundaries so we can actually grow more in God because there's a safety in it. And we grow and we grow and we grow. And the more we keep His commands, the more we express our love and our trust in Him, the more He grows us into His image to be followers or to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Now, th this is another thing. We call ourselves Christians a lot. And we talked about this in Man Church last week when Rick Burchess came down and we had Man Church. And by the way, it was a fantastic evening. Had a wonderful night. And, the, and we were talking about being a followers of Christ. We call ourselves Christians. You know, in the early days, Christians, the name Christian was given as a derogatory remark, a name, so to speak, name calling for those who followed Christ. Christians was not a name that was a value. And then Peter kind of said, hey, let's embrace this thing and, and let's be called Christians and make this a positive thing, okay? And, and, and we kind of did. But the real essence of who Jesus called his disciples, he called them to be followers of Jesus Christ, disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. You know what a follower does of Jesus Christ? It's like a discipleship. A dis Listen, in the old days when they became the young Jewish guy, and when he was about 15 years old, there would be a rabbi that would come in, and there would be two things. See, all Jewish kids were raised to study the Torah and the Tanakh to be able to understand and memorize Scripture and understand God in his writings. At the age of about 13 to 15, they were either chosen to study under a rabbi or send back to his father to be about his father's business, so to speak. Which goes to the phrase when Jesus was missing from the, uh, the, and he was in the temple when they were leaving after the worship and Mary and Joseph went back to find him. And he says, where were you? What were you doing? And what was Jesus' reply? I don't know what you're talking about. I'm about my father's business. 
they were either released to follow or challenged to follow a rabbi or released back to go in apprenticeship to be about their father's business so they would come in the line of their, their followers. And Jesus, as, as, as he was talking about this, and, the, and they were talking, uh, and I just, my mind just went blank. Give me a minute. As Jesus was talking about this, um, I had a good one too, Dad. Keep in my can. If you love me, you, you will keep my commandments. Oh, yeah. The rabbi then would call, we call them fathers of Christ is what we're talking about, discipleships. The, then if you were released back to your father's business, you would do your father's business. But if you were called to be a, a follower of that rabbi, you actually followed them every day, every moment, and everything they did. Everything. If they went to the bathroom... Guess where you would follow them? Into the bathroom. You would be an apprentice. You would follow them and become a disciple. In other words, you were supposed to be a, a mini-me of them. Guess what we're supposed to be of Jesus? A mini-me of Jesus. We're a disciple of Jesus Christ. We say all the time, let us be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. We should be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ because we're followers, we're disciples of Jesus Christ. But now we hang the word Christianese on it and we become a Christian, which becomes a title instead of something that we're doing. Following Jesus means that we're working every day in our hearts and lives to be more like him. We're following him. We're going to the recesses of a heart. We're following to see what God does and how he does. We're reading the word. We're praying. We're doing all these things. We're keeping the commands of God. We're being obedient because we're followers of Christ, not just a name of being a Christian. So the question is, how are you pleasing God today? Are you a follower of Christ or are you just a Christian? There's a huge difference in that. One's a noun. One's an action point. Keeping my commands is a, is a big thing. Aren't you glad I remembered that? I am too, because that's a, that's a powerful point. It's a big point. The third thing of, uh, use, that's necessary to please God is this. You've got to have faith to please God. Hebrews eleven six 6, and without faith, it is what? Anybody know that? It's impossible to please God without faith. Without faith. What is faith? Hebrews 11.1 1 says, faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not. I like to say yet, yet seen. But Scripture says things not seen. It doesn't say you won't ever see it, but it's things yet to be seen. How's your faith? How's your faith? There's some days my faith is really good. And there's some days I have to depend on her faith. There's some days I have to depend on Jerry's faith. And there's some days I have to depend on Lawson's faith. And there's some days y'all have to depend on my faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. And sometimes we get to the place, place where faith is hard to grasp. And folks, that's why it's so important that we meet together and assemble together. Because sometimes we need each other's faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. There's sometimes... That I'll go in and I'll say, we can't do this. This is, I, this is absurd. I, this is, I can't, we can't do this. And she'll say, calm down. Yes, we can. It's going to be fine. Let's take one step at a time. What do we need to do first? 
and then we methodically work it through. All of a sudden, you know what? It happens. I feel like Forrest Gump there. It happens. Why? Because my faith waned, but her faith remained strong. There's sometimes when God needs you to speak into somebody else's life because their faith needs your faith. And sometimes your faith needs to be spoken to others because they need your faith. And sometimes you need to seek them out because you know they have faith and you need their faith. You know how people call me all the time and say, Pastor, I need you to pray for me. I said, you know, you don't need me to pray. You can pray. No, I just need your faith. Oh, yeah, okay, I understand that. I understand that. And sometimes when I need faith of somebody else, I'll call them and they'll say, hey, brother, I just need, I need to, can you help me with this? I need their faith. Faith doesn't mean that we have to possess it all the time. Faith means we have to pursue it all the time. Are y'all listening? Because if you think that you have to have it all the time and you never give room for somebody else's faith to be spoken to you, you'll find yourself in defeat. And that's exactly where the enemy wants you. He wants you discouraged. He wants you in defeated. He wants you demoralized. He wants you to think there's nothing that you can do that's worthy or righteous before God. When God says that when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst. He said, forsake not the assembly together of the saints, that you may be renewed and your heart be encouraged. He says, lean on me and not your own understanding, for I have made you more than overcomers, conquerors bought by the blood of the Lamb. You see, we need to remind ourselves because we are clay pots. And guess what? I'm cracked. I leak. Guess what? You're cracked. You leak. We need to be renewed and refilled on a constant and regular basis. That's why God designed it that way because he knew us better than we know ourselves. When's the last time you've pleased God? I'll tell you how I found this week that I have pleased God. (laughs) You might can relate to this, you might not. I admitted my failure. Do you know what that pleased God? Scripture says that he can't use a proud man. You ever been proud before? Bless God, I hadn't. Do we get proud in our righteousness? Do we get proud in our Christianese? Do we get proud by the way our success surrounds us? Do we find pride in who we are? This week, I messed up. Now, I didn't commit murder. I didn't take drugs. I didn't go out and get drunk. And I didn't sleep with nobody. Well, I wasn't supposed to. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, I said something that wasn't too correct or edifying to a person that I shouldn't have said it to. And I miscommunicated. And it wasn't the intent I had. And I'm the pastor, and I should have all kinds of knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And you know what? When I was called on the carpet about it and said, you know, pastor, you said this, and I just don't believe that's right. And you know what I said? Inside of me, right before it got out here, you know, I wanted to say, what you talking about? I understand exactly what I said, and what I said was true. And by the way, it was true. But Saul also offered a sacrifice that God had told him to make. 
right? It's true. But I wasn't obedient in how I said it. I wasn't obedient in the way I said it. And you know what? It came up to here. I had to suppress that old man. I had to su- suppress Steve. And then I had to pray and ask God. And here's what I said. You know, you're right. I could have done that better. I could have said that better. And I want you to know I apologize. I take full responsibility for that. And you know what they said? They said, oh, it's not a big deal, Pastor. I just wanted to, I said, yeah, it is a big deal. It's a big deal because I got it wrong. And I want you to know I repent. And I'm sorry. That meant a lot to them, they said. And you know what? I got off the phone and it meant a lot to me. You know why it meant a lot to me? It brought me back to reality in the fact that I'm a follower of Christ. I'm not Christ. Are you listening to me? I follow Jesus Christ. I'm not perfect. But you know what? It pleases God when we admit our imperfections. And we come to him and we say, God, I'm sorry. I missed it. I realized it. Please forgive me. And Scripture says that he's faithful and just to forgive us when we come and ask for it. Aren't you grateful for that? I mean, I'm grateful for that. What it produced in me was a reality and an awareness that God is still God and I still need him in every minute way of my life. How about you? When's the last time you please God? Maybe it's submitting a wrongness. Maybe it's surrendering a trust. Maybe it's following in obedience and doing what God told you, how he told you to do it. Maybe it's just a simple fact that you need to talk with him. Pray. Discover who he is by reading his word. And let God do work in you. You don't know how pleasing that is to God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for our time this morning. We thank you that you love us so much. And we thank you, Lord, that we can follow you and trust you in every aspect, in our wrongs and our rights and our indifferences and our failures and in our successes. You're still our God, and we acknowledge and give it all to you. Thank you, Lord. Let us live a life that is pleasing to you, whether it's through repentance or faithful service. Let us always be striving with our whole heart to serve you. We pray this now in Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen.